Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Hardscape Growth Show. We're super excited to be joined by the founder of, I think, the only landscape hardscape company to be named after an Instagram handle. We're joined by Mike Pennington from Paver King Enterprises. Mike, how are you? And welcome to the show. I'm good, Alex. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Mike, we've known each other for uh, for quite a long time now, but uh, for our listeners who may not be familiar with uh, who Mike Pennington is, you want to give us a quick background? Uh, I'm a landscape hardscaper from Ontario. Uh, I've been in the business since the late 80s. Uh, I have done commercial, residential. Um, I have a, I guess I'm best known for uh, my inst- crazy Instagram account slash Twitter account originally. Um, you know, YouTube channel. So I like to have a lot of fun at work. And I think that uh, that's probably what I'm best known for. And I think we crush out some crazy hardscapes. And we've been in the Tecla Block catalog seven years straight with our uh, our fireplace. So I think that that counts for something as well. Yeah, I, Although I don't know if we're in it in 2021. So. Well, we'll see. I'm, I'm not sure either. I haven't seen all the pictures yet. But uh, definitely my favorite posts are the, uh, the pie charts. Those are... Uh, Oh, the pie, yeah, I like the pie charts too. They're fun. Anybody who hasn't uh, hasn't followed at paver underscore king on Instagram, if you're remotely attached to the industry and you're looking for a good laugh, definitely give that account a follow. Um, despite all the joking around and uh, the the silliness that happens on your social channels and even on your job sites. Uh, a big priority for you over your career in your business has been safety. Absolutely. I heard you on another podcast earlier this year. And, and one of the things you talked about was uh, how the industry has changed so much with regards to safety. And even myself, I remember when I was working uh, as a contractor, you know, our, we were driving an old milk truck as a work truck and we had a driver's seat. And all the other seats were upside down milk crates that were bolted to the floor with a little a little seat belt like tied to it. And that, that was it. So um, I know you're passionate about safety. I know you've seen a lot over your, your extensive career. So I wanted to talk to you about safety today. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think it's the, the biggest change in, uh, you know, I can remember um, – dump literally on a Sunday morning, dumping a hundred yards of mulch in a lane of the 401 with no pylons and no signs. And one of, one of my friends who was a baker who had been laid off from the golf course he was working at waving a vest a hundred yards down. Like, and that was like, but that was like normal day. Like people were just that, like, yeah, that's, that's, how how, it was. that's how it goes. And uh, yeah. so I think it's the biggest change. I think it's great. I think it certainly, uh, helps attract more people to the industry, knowing that uh, it's a safer industry to work in. Um, you know, it's, I'm passionate I know about you're not it. Shy to... No, go ahead. Go I'm ahead. passionate about it because I think that it, it's the most important thing is everyone gets home. You know, when you take away profit, loss, a killer job, and if so, if everyone doesn't get home, none of it matters. It's totally irrelevant. Uh, yeah. You know, and one person gets badly hurt you can have an expectation of your company to go on a, a large downward slide uh, in terms of profitability and company morale. So, uh, you know, it's an, it's important on a lot of levels, but getting everyone home is always the most important thing to me. I totally agree with that, um, especially when you think about the fact that you can't, this is one of those businesses, like many, but this is especially one of those businesses that if you don't have the right people in the right frame of mind, you really cannot achieve much. So safety, making sure that you have people uh, in a yeah, safe no. environment, like you, you need that. I think too that, um, I, yeah, go. I think that too in a world of competitive, it's a competitive environment for staff. Um, you know, and it, it isn't anywhere, but in the landscaping business, particularly it's a competitive environment for staff. And I think that, you mean to like attract, attract staff? Yeah, or attract or, or maintain or hold staff. You know, I don't think okay. anyone that anyone that works with us would ever say that, um, you know, the reason that they didn't have a good day at work was because they didn't feel safe. You know, it's just, it's a, a way to eliminate 
and show people that you care about them and that makes I think it makes a big difference to everyone's staff if you're um, you know and we all see them guys still posting the shirtless guy cutting in front of a house with no mask and no and if no you look down now and, and maybe not five years ago but you look down now the, the first 10 comments will be like hey bro put on a mask yeah that's that's definitely a huge change do you want to maybe expand on that point because you said something that's pretty interesting like we know in this industry labor uh is at a premium right now there there is a shortage it's tough to find good people uh and when you do find good people it's tough to have them stick around for a long time do you feel safety plays a big role in that I think it does play a huge role in it. You know, I think that if I don't want to, I don't want to go to an environment where I don't feel safe. I don't want to have that anxiety on a daily basis that I'm worried that something's going to happen to me or no one cares about me or, um, you know, that I could get hurt or what. And I mean, I think that safety culture also in lines that, you know, people feel like if something did happen, you would take care of them. When you are treating people on a job site, like you don't care about whether or not they get hurt or whether or not they go home safe. I don't think that makes them feel very confident that when something does happen, you have a plan to help them. Mm. Uh, you know, which I think if you want to keep people long term, you have to have those kind of plans. Uh, you know, I'm I've told people in my life, you're not getting a raise until I see you wear a mask every time I come to job site. Like, you know, so like is that, that, because I'm not so going to have. That, actually, I want to cut you off there because that, that's something that I know uh, a few guys have, have implemented. I'm curious if, if you have any experience with that, where proper safety protocols for example wearing your ppes wearing your mask your your say eyewear your attenuators wearing that gear is uh part and parcel with executing your job so it's not just time sheets or or productivity or efficiency or overall job uh profitability there's a safety component and if you're not respecting that then you're not going to get your annual bonus or or whatever structure that company has you have any experience with that uh, well, I've told people that they're not getting a raise for um, if they're not going to follow the protocols and wear masks. And I'm like, you know, you're not going to destroy your lungs on my watch. You know, is sort of my take on it. I I agree that it should be part of any program that if someone's not following the protocol, because safety culture is a culture that grows from everyone. And if you have one person that's, you know, if we we do a lot of commercials work mm -hmm. so obviously we you know in the videos anytime that anyone sees us we almost always have vests hard hats the whole nine yards uh, but you get one guy on a job site not wearing a hard hat you watch in a, in a day you'll have 10 guys not wearing hard hats because the vast amount of people are do as someone else does not as you do for yourself so um you know it, it you have to, everyone has to buy in everyone has to do it um what what i've had lots of conversations with people where i'm like if you're not gonna i don't I'm not making the rules. I'm enforcing the rule. The That's rules fair. are there. That's you know, fair. Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Labor creates the rules. It's just a matter of whether or not you choose to enforce the rules. We choose to enforce them because I want people to be safe. Um, you know, those rules aren't there for fun. You know, it it seems crazy to me, but that's yeah. you know, we have a whole thing where we, if they're doing something, I'll say like, you know, guys, that's eminent death. Like, let's <laughs> let's avoid that yeah. because. You know, everyone, everyone has a day where they look at something and someone, oh, and it's always a learning, even for us, it's a learning curve. Like I do stuff and I'm like, oh, that wasn't safe. I won't do that again. Mm -hmm. Or how could that be better? But that, um, I mean, but yeah, for I, that, I, you have a bit of a self-awareness where you're looking at it. And for you, because safety is a priority, you're recognizing like, hmm, this isn't the safest way for me to do this. Or hmm, this isn't the safest environment for me to be in or to put my, my team in right now. I need to do something about that. Um, you made a good point about enforcing those rules and how on a commercial site, especially where you have so many people coming and going, the, the bottom kind of pulls the average down. One guy, no hard hat, everyone else ditches the, the buckets and then you have a bigger problem on your hands because now people aren't following the rules and you don't have a safe work environment. But, you know, that's kind of a, a basic management principle too. Like what, what, you, what you tolerate, you're essentially endorsing. If you let that slide, you're saying it's okay. And if it's okay, well, then everyone's going to do it. So how do you, how do you handle that? Like in actual terms, because like telling people like, Hey man, like you, you got to put the helmet on or you got to put the hard hat on or you got to put the attenuators on. There's only so many times you can say that and threatening with like, you're not going to get your raise or whatever. Well, if the guy's not lined up for a raise or asking for a raise, that's, there's not much 
much at stake there. So like, how, how do you practically address that? Cause I've been on number of job sites where you tell guys and they'll put it on, but as soon as you go back to the truck for something, they take it off. I, I, I think that you no, know, for us, if someone wasn't going to follow the rules, I would just um, part ways with them amicably. You know, like these are the rules that we enforce. This is how we choose to run. Uh, if you choose not to follow those rules, then I mean, Kaz is 62. He's on our sites every day. With him, it's a battle, but I, you know, I've known him since 1988, mm -hmm. and I'm not opposed to at least twice a year. I'll have a conversation with him. Like, listen, either you're gonna do this, or you can just go work some, like, work with someone else. Like, we're not gonna be partners because I'm not gonna watch you kill yourself. So your advice, is to, your advice is to your advice is to just is to just enforce it, disciplined. Yeah, if someone, just, if someone, but it's also to you, like, yeah. You have to be ready to prune the tree. If people believe, if people don't believe you're ready to prune the tree over it, then they're not going to do it. Mm. Um, you know, you have to be prepared to do that. You have to be prepared to, you know, cut the 45 and the guys on the other side of it. Like it just, and if they don't believe you and they won't buy in, yeah. there's always going to be someone who doesn't buy into some hard hats don't fit. Uh, I don't like ear hearing protection. I, can't breathe I don't want to wear a mask. mask. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, like if there's always going to be something that someone's not buying into, um, you know, I, I think it, you just have to, it's like making sure everyone's at the yard on time. Or I think too, as the leader of the, the leader of the group, you have to make sure that you're following those protocols. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in a position where you have five crews and you show up in running shoes and shorts and walk onto a job site and you're not wearing any PPE or boots. You can't uh, have that double standard. The chances, you can't have that double standard. Yeah, you have to be the leader. And if you're not leading that charge, then, you know, I you won't see me get in a machine and not put a seatbelt on. There you go. What's something that, like, is, every... sorry, Mike, what's something that, like, maybe it's, like, a commonly held belief in the industry or, like, a lot of people kind of, like, do things a certain way with regards to, to safety, but you don't you don't agree with or or you do completely differently? Like what is something maybe you think people have got wrong about safety in the workplace and in your company? Uh, I think that the you know the biggest thing that everyone like a lot of people have wrong with safety is that there's a second chance. Mm. You know, like when something happens, you know, like honestly, like the core of safety for us is, and I say it to people all the time, there is no second. Like if someone gets smucked in the head, and I've been on a job site where someone got smucked in the head by an excavator and. I watched their brain fluid leak out of their nose. There wasn't a second chance. I couldn't yeah. go back and change that that chain of events. They, you know, I think that the, the commonly held misbelief is I'll get a second chance because I think in life inherently there's so many second chances and so many times you get to screw stuff up in your life and you still get to come back and try it again. The unfortunate part is when you cut your hand off or um, you know crack your skull or get your eye taken out that chance is gone there isn't and i think that's the that's when people grasp the fact that you can't go back and change things that's when people start to change it's unfortunate normally something has to happen around them for people to that's so take true. it seriously so, but it's so true like uh can uh can i share a story with you a, a, a quick yeah, absolutely one. so like when i when i worked uh in hardscaping I mean, I still am in the industry, but I don't build jobs every single day of the week like I did then. But uh, when I started, one of the first things that I had to do was I had to cut out a curve in a big uh, commercial parking lot. This is many years ago. And, and again, this was the same company where I rode to work, you know, strapped onto a milk carton <laughs> going, to, going, to, going down the highway. Um, but one of the first things was to cut out this curve. And I had never operated a, a cutoff saw before. And I had no training either. It was like, here's how you fire it up. Once you get it fired up, throw your glasses on, let her rip. There's the line, just stay on the line. And because it was a commercial site and they were throwing asphalt along the edge, like even if you're a little crooked, it's fine. No one will know. So have at it, kid. Good luck. And uh, so I'm cutting and I have no idea that I'm using a, a blade that's finished. And by finished, I mean like there are no diamonds left on the on the teeth. 
So this thing is sparking like crazy. And I think this is normal because it's my first time operating the saw. And uh, basically what I'm doing is I'm melting down the saw the, or the saw blade to the point where there are shards of blade that start shooting off and start shooting off behind me. 30, 40 feet behind me is my friend who works with me on the job site who is sweeping sand into the joints. He gets one piece that goes flying through his fingernail on his middle finger and the other one goes through the sweatband on his cap into his forehead. Like you want it, you want to get a wake up call of how dangerous tools can be for me that and that was that was in my third or fourth week on the job in my first summer doing that. Uh, for me, it was like, yeah, they're, they're, we have to have proper training on job sites. So that was a wake up call for me. But for anybody who hasn't had a close call like that, the way that you just described, like if you get smoked in the head by a bucket, or if you miss with that saw blade, or uh, you slip off a wall, like how many guys have I seen carrying a wheelbarrow along the top of a retaining wall trip and the handlebars just flip them over the wall? Like it, there's so many opportunities for you to get hurt. Every day, everything we do is um, dangerous somehow. And it doesn't have to be. And I think that that's the real key is is there's always a level of risk, but there are many, many safe ways to do it through proper training, through proper safety equipment and through having the right the right tools and equipment in the first place and using the right tool for the right job. What's something that maybe I think that makes a big difference. You want why do you say that? You want to expand? No, on I definitely that? think that, that having the right tool for the job makes a big difference. You know, like um, what's an example? Not struggling you? to put things in, or what's an example? You know, we just put in a bunch of armor stones with a moose vacuum lifter, mm -hmm. and you know, we could set them down right to height, yeah, and put them in, and yeah. you know, we picked them up. I've got a million so for, using so forks. Just, and just for like, anybody who doesn't know, it, it's, it's this big vacuum lifter that you can pick up with, with the boom on your excavator with a chain. Yeah. And basically this vacuum can pick up even the heaviest armor stone. Like some of that stuff is, is thousands of pounds. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. We were, yeah, these were big and we were setting them down and, you know, we just shut it off and it, it's off and we don't, we're not wedging around with the forks mm -hmm. and we're not, no one's fingers are in there. And it just, it, it was a good safe way to accomplish what we needed to accomplish. I don't, Maybe we would have finished 15 minutes earlier if we had done it with a set of forks and wedged them in there. But um, it was it was what we felt was the safest way to do it. It was the right tool for the job of what we were trying to accomplish. So I agree, like having the right tools around, you know, even and you know, not if every shovel you have is short and you employ someone that's six foot seven, like that person is inevitably going to hurt their back. Yeah bending over the shovel like it, it, right down to just a shovel it, it's um having the right tools definitely cuts down on also having the right tools cut you know we had a we had a um, a skid steer that was weight weighted to pick up those rocks that way that we were doing it mm -hmm. so you know instead of doing it with a piece of equipment that's too small which i think we got guys, guys balancing guys on the back trying to keep the the weight even. yeah like it's <laughs> we didn't have the guy balancing on the back trying to offset the weight i think that that also leads down a bad route to having equipment that's too small for what you're trying to accomplish. So tell me something, Mike, because a lot of people listening to this show are probably in a position where they're trying to build their business or trying to grow it. And one of the challenges that you face is you probably have a lean team. You probably have some pretty lean cash flow and you probably don't have all the tools and equipment that you wish you could have. So, how how do you tackle that or what advice do you have for someone who's maybe in that position who's hearing this and recognizing like yeah you know what like the right vacuum equipment would make sure that i don't risk any of my guys losing a finger trying to lay armor stone or trying to set you know down a set of of precast 400 pound steps or things like that what what advice would you have uh, well, I mean, we're essentially, I mean, I've been in this business a really long time, but we're essentially a startup, right? Mm -hmm. Like we've, Paver King's been around 19 months. Um, 
So we're essentially a startup business. So we, I'm unhesitant to rent the right equipment for the job. You know, so renting I, means I'm not a the, big provider. Like renting, like uh, so we. So we, you know, we did not that we do a lot of like posts or fence posts. It's not something that we specialize in, so we don't have an auger. But you know, we had like a we, for some reason we were doing some posts. We rented an auger for the day, um, because I didn't want people to have to hand dig them, hurt their backs, mm -hmm. spend all their time bent over. Uh, so you know, we're that would be something we did this year. We rented an auger. Uh, I mean. For us too, we prioritized, um, you know, our safety trailer. Our trailer has a lot of safety stuff in it, and it wasn't inexpensive. But uh, I think that here's a good. So in another role at another company, we were buying a large uh, 25 foot tag along float for behind our tandem dump truck. And when I ordered the float, because I was you know part of purchasing there, um, I ordered the airlift ramps. Yeah. Okay. And the owner of the company, you know, looked at the invoice before signing off on the final purchase and was like, I'm not paying $1,500 for airlift ramps. That's outrageous. It's insanity. I'm not doing it. And I was like, I literally just turned into one sentence and said, how much are you going to pay the first time someone hurts their back lifting those ramps? These are big, heavy ramps, you know, it's a 30 ton float. Um, and he was like, oh, you're right. And I'm like, so... You know, that small, every time you invest in something safety wise, they're, they're, you know, in a business sense, you're probably saving money somewhere down the line um, in terms of at big picture first of all, someone getting hurt. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like those ramps um, probably save someone wrenching their back at some point. Uh, you won't know. It's that's the problem. The yeah, ROI that, on yeah. that stuff is you don't know how you don't know how many times you saved someone. Yeah. But you, you're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And I think that's and really people key. know that. I think that's really key. Like in everything, in all the time I've known you, that at the core, you're always doing what's right for the people that are working with you, and you're treating them with the utmost respect. And I think that that's, I mean, that, that's something you should be you should be proud of. But I think that's something that that is totally um, at the core of of what safety really needs to mean in your business, like. If you respect the people who work with you, you will provide a safe environment, and you will give them access to the safe, uh, the right tools and equipment and 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 PPE to be safe. And you're gonna give them that training because it's out of respect for the hard work that they put in to help you build your business and 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 do what you want to do. Uh, absolutely, yeah. For us, it's a you know, for Kelly, my wife, who runs our office, and myself, and for our our staff, our team, it's like a hundred percent, literally the most important thing. It's number one on our, our list everywhere we go. Um, you know, there's we have eye wash station, we have all that stuffs on site all the time mm -hmm. in the trailer. Um, you know, I think too, in it, it, there's an inevitability in our environment in Ontario that MOL is coming. What does that mean to, for people not familiar with that? What, what does that uh, mean? Ministry of Labor. Okay. So in our, in Ontario, the MOL is the Ministry of Labor. Okay. So and like for listeners in the States, it's like OSHA. Like OSHA. Uh, if you yeah, go back, States, it's like the OSHA. CNES, ST, WSIB, or, or what, all these different organizations across North America. They're, they're coming for you <laughs> as a business owner. <laughs> Just like the IRS and Revenue Canada, yeah. they're coming for you. And uh, being prepared for that day, uh, you know, we had a MOL inspection, Ministry of Labor inspection this year. They came on site, they walked the site. Everyone was wearing PPE. Everyone had um, boots, safety boots. That's one thing we do with our people is we buy their safety boots, uh, and we we buy them the Cool Works pants with the mesh bottoms and, mm -hmm. and they're also reflective, which I think is important. They have reflective, reflective bands on them. Yeah. Um, you know, those aren't, those aren't big investments in your people. So those are pretty small investments, but the safety of, and so that inspection for us was a five minute ordeal. Yeah. We had instead of a $5,000 um, fine. fine. Yeah. And a shutdown of your job. Yeah. You know, um, you know, we had our green book on site, uh, the Ministry of Labor Green Book. We had our field level risk assessments done that day. 
Um, we, I mean, in the current environment, we do our COVID assessment every day. Yeah. Uh, you know, so if they ask, um, so you know, can, we had, can we can we drill into just a couple of those things? I just want to come back to the the rental thing real quick because you make it a priority to rent stuff. Um, how do you make sure? Because renting has a cost, right? So how do you make sure that you're recovering that cost when you're looking at a project? Is it because you've you've designed the project, you're looking at the scope of work? and you're assessing the, the site conditions and you're determining in advance of pricing the job that you're going to have to rent specific pieces of equipment to maintain a safe environment? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. So, but I also look, you know, our staff is, um, four of us are 50 or close to 50 or over 50. And one of our staff is 28, our, our field staff. That's not including our truck driver, yeah. because Christy's, an important cog in her wheel, but she's not on. She's not on the site. sites all the time. Yeah, she's not on the site. So, you know, when I look at projects, I there's projects that I've looked at in the last two years that I've I've said, okay, this isn't a good project for us because it's too much, uh, quite frankly, manual labor that we can't use our machines and we can't use um, we can't use different things to alleviate that stress on 50 year old bodies. So when it comes to even looking at a project and saying. You know, one of the things that I look at, we don't have a roller. It's not a safety issue, but just as an example of a way to recover that cost, we don't have a roller packer. Okay. Um, you know, we like it's a to me, it's a big it's a big drop for a one item thing. But I think it's vastly important to a hardscape install. I'm not going to minimize the install. So, you know, I have an allowance for a rental for and in, in that rental. I'm not just allowing for the rental. I'm allowing for someone to go get it. Mm -hmm because it doesn't just drop from the sky. Okay. So allowing a hundred dollars to rent it is great, but it actually costs, you know, $75 to pick it up and $75 drop it off. Yeah. So if you don't um, recover so that, you lost 150 bucks. You, you lost hundred. So, you know, it, it, when I look at a job and I'm saying, okay, we're going to put in, um, you know, we did a, a large block retaining wall uh, this year up the side of a driveway. And I know that our E20 won't lift those blocks successfully. So uh, we, I knew we were going to have to rent a larger excavator. I mean, we could try it with the E20 and struggle through it and probably waste time and money and put people at risk, or we can allow, uh, you know, $350 to rent the bigger excavator. Mm -hmm. And that's something we did. And that was purely a safety and efficiency call to rent that excavator. So when you're pricing out the job, you're looking at what's the efficient way to do it, what's the safe way to do it, do I have that piece of equipment? If I don't, what's the rental rate? Work that into my bid so that I'm recovering those costs and not compromising my profitability. This is the short answer. <laughs> Sorry, you disappeared. So yeah, I'll, I missed I'll, that yeah, part That's of it. okay, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it. So basically, when you're looking at a project, you're looking at what equipment do I need to do this efficiently and safely? Do I own that equipment? If I don't, I'm going to rent it. I'm going to build in the rental rate into my bid so that I recover those costs and still maintain my profit margin at the end of the job while creating the right environment for my team to build it. That's yeah, those are definitely that's I mean, my process probably isn't all those steps because it's me. But yeah, that's the that's the generalized process is that, you know, we oftentimes the safest way is also the most efficient way. Mm. But it's also sometimes costs more if you don't have the right items. But I would always allow to rent the right items or um, or also purchase the right. You know, if you look at something you're like, OK, we're doing eight jobs this year, then maybe it's worth purchasing that item you know it doesn't have to be a big item either like i used an excavator as an mm -hmm. example but it could be a smaller item that uh you know like a iq saw yeah um you know yeah but that, you still you still have to make sure that you're you're recovering those costs with all the projects that you're doing so whether it's a smaller tool that goes into your overhead or it's a piece a larger piece of equipment that goes into your direct costs you need to recover that in the selling of all your projects throughout the year otherwise you're not making the profit that you think you are you may even be losing money. 
Um, uh, yeah, hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah, that's like you know, overhead recovery cost is a crazy game because there's like you know, I say that and people are like, oh, and I'm like, okay, if you don't know that, you're yeah. in big trouble. Like, that's you know, another like, show, Mike. Can, we'll do that one. It's on totally another, another show, yeah. man. I can talk about that for a long time. So, but, um, you know, it's not my image that i know about those things but like i can talk about it for a long time <laughs> there's another thing that you uh you brought up which was the uh you get boots for all your your people you get the cool works pants which uh i'm a fan of uh like you said they have the reflective bands they breathe and you're giving your team clothing to work safely and to not have to scrap their own clothing in a job that really burns through boots and pants like there's no tomorrow do you see that as an advantage to your business? Is that something that you you can market to attract more people to join your company? Do you see it uh, as something that just helps you keep people? Like, why why was that important for you? Uh, so last year, so we started last year. Last year, we had one staff member, and I said that you know his boots were in um, rough condition when he first started with us. So. We said to him, go get a pair of boots. We'll reimburse you for them. Like, you know, I don't want. And he came back with, um, you know, a pair of boots. I'm sure they were good boots from um, from Walmart and gave us a, reimbursed us at a $49.95. They were, we reimbursed them. But this season when we went to it, I went to look at that. I said, okay, we're, you know, we sent everyone the Blundstone website because I did the research. They say they're the best ergonomical boots. They're better for your back, better for your hips, better for walking and spending all day. And they're lighter. Um, so we you know we did the research and we just sent them the website link and said pick out the boots you want. That's that's and nice. you know I think our investment in the crew for all the boots was fifteen hundred dollars. You know in the grand scheme of the of the whole year, like our I mean how scalable that is I don't know because we're talking about a company with five five of us that are in the well six of us that are in the field and one in the office. So you know how scalable it is I don't know, but for that's us very, you know that fifteen very. that fifteen hundred dollars. Um, you know, watching all of our staff have proper safe footwear that was comfortable. I mean, we have one staff you could sell his posture was better by the end of the year just from go. having a really well, I, a really good You're pair on of your boots. feet all day. If you're not wearing the, the, the right footwear, and I could tell you from my own experience, like when I first started in the industry too, like the fifty dollar boots at Walmart made a lot of sense. Then you wear them for a month and you're like, no. And now, like, if I'm not wearing a pair of Blundstones or, or Royer's, which I also own, like, both very comfortable, very uh, light, and you don't feel, like, your feet aren't killing you by lunchtime. You know, like, if you got to take your, your boots off at lunchtime and, like, be rubbing your feet and eating a sandwich and sitting in an upside-down wheelbarrow, like, you're not wearing the right boots. Like, like you got enough, enough things to worry about. You don't need to worry about your feet, too. Uh, how to make those guys feel though, when you told them like, "Hey, go on this website and pick out," you know, because they're not they're not they're not cheap boots. They're great quality, but they're also not the least expensive boots out there. Uh, I think they all they all appreciated it, except for Christy. She wanted Timberlands, oh. so she got Timberland boots. But she's always like, these won. boots are not my style. Yeah. They're not my style. So, uh, I think they all appreciated. I think that it showed that you know we cared about them. Um, having good quality stuff to work. I think that uh, it's the same thing came in with the, the pants. Mm -hmm. I feel like when you, if you're, if you start if you launch off at seven in the morning, your most productive hours in my experience are between seven, 11, 30, just before lunch. And then you really have a declining scale after that mm -hmm. of productivity. That's just my opinion. Someone could say the opposite, but in my experience, sure. um, so you know, I felt like if someone, if they had pants that were like shorts and still safe and still legal, um, you know, that might add, even if we added, say th those pants are you know, around $110 a pair when you order them, we get them delivered to the house. Mm -hmm. um, so they're about $110 a pair. I don't, if I got, say on our sliding scale of productivity, if I got an extra half an hour a day or three quarters an hour a day of more prime productivity because of those pants for a hundred dollars. I think they all have three, two pairs or three pairs now. Um, you know, we bought a pair to test them out to see if everyone liked them. Yeah. And then we expanded, uh, you know, like I think that if you were to look at that, you would say that hundred dollars 
versus you know that extra 45 minutes of productivity over mm -hmm. weeks months years potentially um for us it was a no-brainer to take care of the people that way that's such a smart way to look at it like you're looking at it again the big picture like yeah i'm gonna drop this much money now buying these pants but these pants will make my team more comfortable while still maintaining a safe environment They'll be a little bit cooler, especially when it gets particularly hot. And that might make them maintain a, a, a good production level just a little bit longer. And you multiply that by the number of days on site where they're wearing these pants and the pants pay for themselves tenfold. Oh, absolutely. It's such a Same smart way to look at it. You can look at that for the boots, like we just compared before, the pants. You can look at it for the safety gear, any of the PPE. And you can look at that for the equipment, whether it be the vacuum lifters, whether it be motorized wheelbarrows, whether it be getting the longer handle shovel for the for the, the taller uh, people on your team, like all of that stuff. When you look at it long term, a safer environment is more efficient. You said that, and I believe that's 100 percent true. And if you have a better efficiency rate over a longer period of time because people stick around longer. A, because it's a better environment and B, because they're not getting hurt, you build momentum with people too because they learn skills, they are part of a team, you get chemistry going. It's all good things for your business. And it starts with creating that safe environment up front. I think too, you know, I think one of the greatest sources of um, finding new employees is the current employees that you have. Mm. Referrals. You know, like... I, th I think that, yeah, I, I, people always talk about referral. Where do you get your leads from? Everyone says, oh, I get referrals. Um, marketing you know, is which, to get customers and, and to build a team. And to build a team. You yeah. need to apply the same that, tactics on both sides. I feel like if our team is talking to their family or their friends or their relatives or, you know, our team's out, out you know, or, you know, inherently your people are going to be friends with lots of other people that are in the same business. That's just... That's just a fact. I mean, it's not like, you know, when people are like, oh, they left me for a dollar. Well, they didn't just randomly meet that person. Like that person met them and, and, yeah. and marketed to them, just like you said, just in a different way. I feel like if, when our team talks to people, they'll, they would say that, you know, we're running in a safe shop where we're purchasing and making sure people are taken care of. If someone, you know, one of our guys came to me this year and, and was, uh, you know, concerned about putting no smoking signs in all the machines. Um, you know, and I was like, yeah, you're right. So we ordered them immediately, you know. Also, all our machines have a little no smoking sign in them. Our tool trailer has a no smoking sign in it. None of us even smoke. I'm not sure why it was a concern, but it was an illegitimate, it was a legitimate concern. If we hired a new person or a new mm -hmm. person came on site or say someone on site borrowed our machine for a few minutes, he wanted to establish their non-smoking machines. Uh, so, you know, I think that if someone... It's really easy to brush off someone's safety concern. Mm -hmm. It's easy when someone comes in and says, I don't think that's safe to brush it off. And I'll be the first, you know, I don't throw stones from a glass house. So I've brushed off many a safety concern in my life. You know, I, I'm not a perfect person. I've made lots of mistakes. I've built pressure treated walls with the best. Thing. <laughs> and, you know, like, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. But I think I, the key is, is, is recognizing when you make mistakes and learning from them. And it sounds super cliche, but like it, it's it's just having this growth mindset that every day you can get better, you can get smarter, you can get stronger if that's what you want to do. In order to do that, you have to recognize that you need to be able to change what you have done so far. That's just part of it. Yeah. I, it's a, I think this past safety too is even like equipment maintenance. Mm. Um, you know, we, we fill out sheets for our equipment every single day. Uh, we maintain it on a heavy schedule. Uh, like even our, so our, our triaxle dump truck, it costs a lot of money to maintain it. It's not an uh, easy piece of equipment on your wallet. Um, but when we first have, or we have a mobile mechanic that services it. And when he first started with us, he would call me about like all these things. And I'm like, listen, bro, that truck weighs like, you know, 40,000 kilograms rolling down the road or I think it tears out at 38.9. I can't remember exactly. I'm like, I don't want anything on it that's not perfect. Like, fix it. That's my, my statement is fix it. Like, you know, 
if the front like Christy had a debate about the front steer tire on the truck because front steer tires are fifteen hundred dollars a piece and she's like I think I could get another month out of it and I was like I'm gonna tell you right now if that front steer tire blows when you're loaded is that gonna be you to call you're not gonna be the one that calls to tell me that happened because you're going to be dead yeah so go get a tire fifteen hundred bucks I don't like. If I'm not charging enough for the truck to, to maintain it, or I'm not charging enough for the skid steer, or I'm not charging enough to maintain a stone saw, or what, right down to the smallest piece of equipment, if I'm not charging enough to maintain those things, then I need to sit down and reassess what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. If I can't take care of that equipment. Yeah, you can catch me on Instagram, at RC Outdoor. Um, feel free to hit me up, any messages, any questions. Um, I do want to give back to the industry. I feel like the industry has definitely given to me a lot of information, a lot of value. So hit me up. Any questions, I don't mind reaching back out to you. It might take more than a day, um, but reach out. I'd love to help out any way I can. Accounted for. It's just like building an interlocking concrete pavement or a sacramental retaining wall. Like all of the pieces need to be there and they all need to work together. Otherwise, you don't have a system. If you don't have all these things together, you don't have a business. You just have a bunch of people working, hopefully making money. Yeah, I, I, I feel like if you're not making a valid attempt to follow the majority, I think any small business is going to struggle to follow every single government regulation. That's being real about it, uh, because the goal is perfection. perfection. Yeah, I don't have the same ability to follow uh, government regulations that Coca-Cola does. Like, right. But I think that you, you have to strive to follow as many as humanly possible um, to create that safe environment for people. It's I think if you're not do, doing that, you're really running your business. And I say this a lot about when people ask me about cash work. Uh, if you're doing that kind of stuff, you're running your business under a false economy and your business is destined to fail. Because at some point, reality is going to catch up with your false economy business and you're going to be like, oh, I'm not charging enough. And you're destined for either very hard times or bankruptcy. Uh, and I've seen that happen to, you know, a million guys that, um, not a million, but a lot in 30 years who are running their, running their businesses under some kind of false economy. Mm. I think that everybody's doing that somewhere, but you got to, like, if you're running the majority of your stuff under that, you're running your equipment, you're not maintaining it, you're not changing the oil, you're not checking the hydraulic fluid, you're not you know replacing tracks on your you know we have a we have our accounting separated into four accounts now i think we're going to switch to six this year um, and one of the things we have is machine maintenance so when the tracks on our t t595 which i know now have 700 hours on them maybe we're going to get 1200 13 hours 100 depending on what it does uh, we already have the money put away to replace those tracks i don't want people running threadbare tracks that are going to snap or the tracks keep coming like it's you know we're going to replace that when it needs to be we have a budget for it because i feel like that's a safety issue too i think and i think that's uh that's a that's a good way to to kind of round out this conversation as we talked about the importance of safety we talked about some of the things that we can do to be safe and we talked about how do you fund that safety uh which is equally important because without the money you can't afford to have that safe environment um Mike, this has been super interesting for people who want to be able to reach out to you or, 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 um, have a conversation, pick your brain on some of this stuff, tap into that 30 plus years of experience. What's the best way to do that? Uh, if I respond to every single DM on Instagram, which is, uh, at, at under paper underscore King, I respond to every DM. Um, so if you want any, if you want to know anything about our business, it's an open book. I don't make stuff up. I'll tell you exactly what we're charging. I'll tell you what we paid for stuff. I don't have anything to hide. Um, you know, you know that you've known me for 10 yeah. years. I'm pretty, pretty, uh, open about everything. So if you want to DM me or, you know, if you go to our, my email is on our website, our website's paverking.ca. You know, I, those are two great ways to get a hold of me. Um, you know, I'm always, I think even the, I think our, the, your Instagram lists your phone number too. So, you know, any of those things, um, but I do respond to every single DM and every single email I get, which yeah. is tedious at times. But, um, but you know, like, I think that it's important. There's a lot of younger people that message me and I don't want them. I want them to know whatever piece of information they need. I'll give them my honest opinion on it. So those are the best ways to get a hold of me.
Mike, you're always a, a pleasure to talk to, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to be a recurring guest on the, on the show here. Thanks for talking to us about safety. It's super important. You've had a long career because of safety, and we want everyone else listening to do the same. Thank you very much, and uh, that's it for this one, guys.